I'm on holiday in Devon, and we're just out for a dog walk with the kids, and I've come across these rather incredible structures here. Now I know these are lime kilns, and this is scattered all around here. This is sort of the South Devon area, um, where limestone was quarried, put into these kilns and burned, and it's all about how to make the building materials that were used to build a lot of our traditional construction. Now, through the power of digital editing, I'm going to go live now back to Stephen in the studio, who's going to talk about the lime cycle and what these meant and how it all works. Over to you, Stephen. Hi, Rich. Thank you for the question. I'm happy to talk about the lime cycle. But before I get on to that, I'm out this afternoon myself. I'm at Hatfield Forest and I'm at the Flint House in the forest. And as you can see, it's finished with flint and it's got a lovely star figure in flint there. Now, this has recently been restored. I don't know if you can see it. It's been recently restored using lime mortar. So I'm going to go back to the office and talk more about the lime cycle for you. Thanks very much. Bye. Hello, here I am back in the office. And the first thing I should mention is, I got the name of the house wrong. Instead of Flint House, I should have said Shell House. Forgive me for that mistake, but I had a couple of grandchildren running around whilst I was trying to record that piece to camera. Anyway, Let's get back to the lime cycle. Now, Rich had come across a lime kiln and was wondering how that was used to form lime that we then use in building and construction works. It is part of the process often called the lime cycle. To understand this process, we need to go back to the very beginning. To create lime mortar or any lime-based product that we might then use in building, we have to start with calcium carbonate. Now, this is what we commonly refer to as limestone, but there are other sources of calcium carbonate that can include chalk and oyster shells. In fact, we've often found remnants of oyster shells in historic mortars. On rare occasions, we sometimes find eggshells as well. The important thing is to start with a good source of the calcium carbonate. This is then taken to a lime kiln where it is burned. The temperature of the kiln has to be at least 840 degrees centigrade, and it is most efficient when operating between 900 and 1000 degrees centigrade. At these temperatures, the calcium carbonate undergoes a process called calcination. Calcination is where it releases the carbon dioxide and forms calcium oxide. Now, this is what we commonly refer to as quicklime. The next stage in the cycle is to take that quicklime and introduce water. Now, quicklime has a violent reaction when water is added and it boils. This is part of the process is called slaking. The amount of water used will determine the nature of the lime that results. But for the purpose of this video, let's assume that we're simply making a lime putty. So our quicklime, calcium oxide, has combined with water and it has now become lime putty or calcium hydroxide to give it the proper chemical term. If this is kept away from contact with the atmosphere, it stays in the form as produced. Therefore, if we keep it under a small layer of water in a watertight tub, it can remain in that state for many years. In fact, we often say that it matures over time. However, as soon as it is used in a building, such as mixed with an aggregate to form a mortar, render, or pointing mix, then a process called carbonation begins. Now, carbonation is where the water evaporates away, but carbon dioxide is absorbed. If we then look at the chemical formula, we realize that we have got back to calcium carbonate. Therefore, the material used in our building is chemically the same material that we started with, hence why we call this the lime cycle. Now, I apologize for having used a number of chemical terms, but it is only by understanding the chemistry that we see the beauty of the lime cycle. Now, I hope this short video has helped you to understand this process. Thank you very much, and back to you, Rich. Thanks, Stephen. Um, I'm back in the office now, having come back from Devon, and that's a really clear explanation, as always, on the lime cycle. So, really appreciate that. Now, I have to admit, I did actually do a bit of the lime cycle during my A-level chemistry, 
And I think we covered some of it then, but that was over 25 years ago and I did only get a B. So let's just say it was quite useful to have a refresher. One thing I do know though, and it's really important to understanding conservation work, is that not all lime is the same. And when we burn a very pure limestone, as we've just been talking about, you get a lime that sets slowly by reacting with carbon dioxide from the air. And we call that a non-hydraulic lime. But if that limestone contains natural impurities, which is very often the case, things like clay or silica, then when it's burned in the kiln, it actually produces slightly different chemical compounds. And it's these that allow the lime to set by reacting with water instead, or as well as. Now we call those hydraulic limes, and it behaves a bit more like cement in that way, setting even when it's damp. Now that's something we'll explore in future videos, the different types of hydraulic lime, how we classify them, and also how additives like pozzolans can tweak the properties of lime waters even further. All of these things matter when you're specifying materials in older buildings, and it's not just about strength, it's about compatibility, vapour movement, and letting the building perform as it was originally intended. Hope you've enjoyed that little video. Thank you for watching. Let us know about any comments or things you'd like to see in the future in the comments. You've been listening to Talking Conservation, the podcast all about conservation of old, traditional and historic buildings and sites. With me, Stephen Boniface. And me, Rich Aylesbury.